From the keyboard to the boardroom, this is the business of esports. Keyboard to the boardroom. This is the Business of Esports podcast. I am Paul Dawalibi. I'm joined today by my friend and co-host, the Honorable Judge Jimmy Barada. For those of you who are new here, welcome to the official podcast of esports. What we do is we cover the most pressing gaming and esports topics and news of the week, but we look at all of it through a business and C-suite lens. We dissect, we analyze the business implications of everything happening in this industry. If you're a regular listener, thank you guys for tuning in every week. Thank you for all the love, the five-star ratings and reviews. If you haven't yet, go subscribe to the podcast so you get notified. We're putting out like at least three episodes a week now between the new show, the main podcast here, and now Office Hours with The Professor, which I would love everyone's feedback on. It's William Collis's, aka The Professor's new show. But make sure you leave a review, uh, whether it's on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Google Play or wherever you get this podcast. Leave that review. It helps other people find the podcast because of the algorithm in the background. So we appreciate all of you. Jimmy, how you doing this week? Hey, Paul. What's up, everybody listening? I'm, I'm doing great and, you know, happy to, to be recording another fresh episode for everyone. Like Paul said, we have so much content coming out. Uh, we really hope you enjoy it. And I'm really excited for, you know, 10 times as many brands, concepts, <laughs> I, you know, ideas that we have in, in the backlog. And uh, we're, we're just really excited to share it with you. So yeah, I, like Paul mentioned, we look at all the feedback, the LinkedIn comments, the YouTube comments on social, uh, and would love to hear, uh, thoughts on, on, on the professor, which I know many of you missed him, but, uh, me personally, you know, I'm doing great, kind of a, a weird week, I think for news, a lot of good news, a lot of not so good news, which we'll get into on the live show, I'm sure. And uh, I'm just looking for a new game to play. Honestly, I got <laughs> there's uh, nothing, yeah, Jimmy. There's, there's nothing. nothing. Yeah. There's nothing. There's like literally nothing. Yeah, I was even watching XQC stream earlier, and he even he was complaining. And this guy plays like any random game on Steam. He was complaining. There's really nothing out there and like new worth like investing time into. And I watch these. I, I, I like I have this beef to pick. Or I just I need to get this off my chest. I watch these Elden Ring streamers and I have zero desire to play this game. Like, I, let me just say, I've never been into Dark Souls like type games. Um, so maybe that's it. So obviously I'm, I'm biased, mm -hmm. but I just I don't get the appeal. I just don't get it. I mean, the clips look kind of funny when you see these bosses that people are about to beat. And then next thing you know, they just get completely wiped. But I'm, you know, I want to do something enjoyable and this just <laughs> looks like a grind. Right. Uh, and that's my, yeah, that's, that's my take on it. It's not even like a fun cause there are fun or like rewarding grinds. Right. I feel like you grind these bosses, you die over and over and over again, only to then just fight another boss. That's like the same role to evade mechanic. I, I don't know. I just. This, this is why I replay Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic once a year is just because that's a great game, a great story, and nothing has lived up to it in 20 years in my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm increasingly convinced, like to bring this back to a business conversation, I'm increasingly convinced, and I've said this before, I probably said it a year ago, I probably said it two years ago, I think a lot of people laugh when I say it, but I know I'm right, as always, you know, I just, I see the future. The biggest threat to the gaming industry is just the total lack of innovation, inspiration, you name it, in terms of getting new games. They're just everything's so cookie cutter, everything's so uninspired. I've never seen in my, you know, 30 plus years of being a gamer, so few interesting titles out, so little innovation around the actual games themselves, right? Like just tons of innovation in everything else, business models, like you name it. Um, but the games themselves, I feel like this is the lowest low probably in the last 30 years, maybe a hot take, but definitely a hot take. 
uh josh you're listening clip that (laughs) but 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 you know a great segue as well and i'll let you lead into our guests but i think the innovation around gaming is not lacking it's really the gaming ip itself agreed And and to that note i think we have an amazing guest today doing some great stuff with content with tech Uh, i'll let you take over paul but i'm super excited for today's episode yeah and that's the silver lining jimmy you i think you hit the nail on the head it's like all the cool innovation that's happening around gaming i think what there were like at peak innovation um and that that at least you know makes me feel better Uh, on that note we have on the podcast today none other than vj kaduri who is the co-founder and ceo of a company called sizzle uh, VJ spent many years in the tech and AI world um, at Google and and Adyen, and he's going to talk about all this. VJ, welcome to the Business of Esports podcast. Awesome, great to be here, Paul. Great to hear be here, Jimmy. Um, awesome, love your podcast. So really honored and excited to be here. VJ, for our listeners, would love a bit of your background. You know why you got into gaming, how you got into gaming. What were some of the reasons? And and obviously to, would love to hear about like what Sizzle's doing, what you guys are focused on, um, some of the VJ and Sizzle story. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so my background is a little bit more on the tech side. You know, I grew up in the 80s. So back when I was growing up, Atari was it, you know, as far as gaming. Um, and then, you know, got to Nintendo in late high school, early college, and then in Sega, then it got into Sega. So, you know, a lot of those early games, but, you know, when I went to the workforce, you know, I started off in management consulting and then, um, I, I joined Google after a few years and I spent a long time at Google. And so I, that's where I sort of l- learned my ropes about the tech world. And that got into a lot of AI work at Google too. And, um, and after Google, I let, uh, I, you know, I was on I was on the founding team of Google Pay, and doing a lot of payments work. And then uh, I joined a company called Adyen, which is a international payments company, and I was heading up their marketing, and did that for a couple of years. And uh, that's when my friend called me up, and him and I had started a, a web hosting company back in the '90s, and you know we had been co-founders together. And he had called me up, and he was like, and at the time he was doing. Um, video editing for sort of indie movies and shorts down in LA. And so him and his buddies actually made a couple of good movies and a bunch of shorts. They even won an award, but he calls me up and he was like, video editing is a pain in the butt. Like it's a royal pain in the butt. It is so hard to like edit stuff. And he calls me up and he was like, we got to do something about editing. Um, and that wasn't quite sizzle. That was sort of the precursor to sizzle. We built a site called hashcut.com. Um, so we can get into that, but, you know, after getting into editing, you know, and building a a video editing product, then we real we sort of backed into gaming because we realized a lot of gamers were using our product and that's how, that was sort of how sizzle came about. And, and and Vijay, could you like uh, for the, uh, for audience that maybe doesn't know about sizzle, like. What sure. is it that you guys do? What is the product? What's the, you know, what's the the short pitch there? Yeah, absolutely. So what we do is we leverage AI to analyze Twitch and YouTube streams to figure out the best moments for you. So we auto create clips and highlights. So we, you know, analyze the video, the audio and the chat to figure out where, you know, are the kills or the goals in FIFA or what have you, the, the best moments within each game. And then the audio and the chat tells us the excitement factor. So the audio tells us, you know, the caster or the streamer, how excited are they when one of those moments are happening? Um, And the chat tells us how excited the audience is. So, you know, if we detect 20 kills in a match, we know which are the best five or best best six kills based on all of these excitement factors. And so, so that's what we do. I mean, we basically process six hour streams figure out where all the matches are and figure out uh, the best moments within each match. I I think it's so brilliant. I mean, if you're playing video games and you're recording yourself, you have to be clipping content and it's such an easy solution, right? To have your AI analyze that for the gamer, they can spend more time gaming. You know, I'm curious uh, the different games that you support and how your AI goes about learning what's important in a sports game versus a FPS or, you know, the other genres that you might support. Sure, sure. 
Yeah, I mean, game by game, it's definitely a little bit different. Although, like all the battle royale games, for instance, are are fairly similar. Um, so yeah, so the, some of the games we support would be like on the battle royale side, we do Fortnite, PUBG, Warzone. So a lot of those games, it's um, analyzing first of all when is a kill happening, when is a knockdown happening, how many people are left in in the game, right? If you know there's um, a mediocre kill, but there's only 10 people left in Fortnite, that's pretty important. So, you know, depending on where, uh, where we are in the match, that's, that's good context. Um, but then, you know, getting to the next level of detail within those kills, right? Is it, uh, what's the weapon type? You know, is it a long sniper shot? Um, so even though that may show up just as a normal kill, you know, recognizing that context is pretty important. So we try to, to you know detect as much as we can to give us more about the context behind the kills um and it's not just the kills right it's the battle scenes it's sometimes you know if there's a kill can just happen in a second but there may have been 30 or 45 seconds where there's the full battle so are we detecting gunfire at the start of the battle are we detecting you know multiple people on screen are we detecting you know when does the battle end there may have been five kills within that 30 seconds so let's consider that a full battle scene as opposed to five different moments. Um, so it's those types of judgments that we have to make within sort of battle royale games. A sports game like FIFA would be very different because we're we're looking at um, we have to detect completely different things in the AI. Like we have to track the ball. That's a completely different model than than figuring out a kill in Fortnite. Um, and then, so once you track the ball, then you have to detect, okay, is the ball going inside the net? So we have to detect the goalpost and the net and see, is the ball inside the net? So that's a different model. Or if it's a corner kick, you know, we have to detect the corner, right, of, of the field. So, you know, and the ball has to be on that exact T-junction of the corner. So we, you know, we can tell that, hey, if the ball is there, that's a corner kick. So building out models for each of these games can be pretty intensive and you know we have to think of all the different scenarios for that and build the appropriate models bj how much are the developers involved in something like this right like uh, do most games um surface data that you guys can ingest in real time are you doing a lot of like without giving too much of the secret sauce right are you doing a lot of image processing of like the, the the person playing in real time is it does it all happen after the fact like how, how are you how do you guys approach this specifically i'd love to understand the relationship with the developers of the games themselves if there is any yeah no that's a fantastic question and a lot of these developers do have apis and a lot of them don't at least that they publicly acknowledge so riot for instance has great apis and for league or for valorant They've, we've talked to them, they've given us developer access so we can plug into those APIs and get a lot of data. It's still not 100% API um, because we still need to, you know, their API might match, uh, might map up to a specific match. Um, and on a Twitch stream, there could be six matches. So mm-hmm. you still need to use a certain amount of AI to figure out which match is Riot talking about within, even though you have the day correct and potentially the player correct, if the player played six matches within that day on that stream, you still have to use AI to figure out which, you know, which match is it. So then you can use the rest of the um, rest of the API data. So there is still AI involved. It's very rarely 100% API because the API just maps to the matches and not the Twitch streams. So, so Riot is a good example of API. Um, but there's a bunch of other uh, publishers that don't have great APIs or don't um, easily give third-party developers like third-party you know, tech developers like us easy access. So in those cases, like for FIFA, for instance, it is 100% AI, um, even in the case of, of like Fortnite or something, we're using mostly AI. So it, it, goes, it, it varies from game to game, depending on our relationship with the publisher and depending on our level of access. Sorry, go ahead, Jimmy. I was going to ask, you know, uh, as far as your relationships with the publishers, from a from a biz dev perspective, in terms of continuing to grow your business, what is the ideal partner for you? Is or what's the ideal pathway? I suppose is it more partnerships 
with these publishers where you can get a, a more in-depth involvement with their games? Or is it uh, more B2C focused and just growing your user base, uh, supporting them with your AI and the mixture uh, that, that, that you had just spoken towards and just saying, hey, you know, the product is great. A lot of these people use it for X, Y, and Z, and we're solving 90, 95% of that use case. And, and so we have something already. Yeah. So again, great question. And, you know, that, that really leads us to the two paths, our two customer bases for our business. So we do work for streamers uh, and we give streamers back highlights of their streams. And we also do work for esports leagues. So, for instance, starting with the latter for esports leagues, we're doing a lot of work for PUBG Americas. So, you know, they currently they just finished an ESL tournament and they've got um, PCS six PUBG Continental Series six about to start next week. So for the past year or so, we've been crunching highlights for all of their tournaments and we give them a, a fully baked highlights portal and um and they take those highlights and they, they, we allow them to search through all of their highlights by player, by team, by type of moment. If they want to say, hey, show me all the best grenade kills on you know, Friday last week, we can do that. We can say, okay, here's all the grenade kills. And then they can further specify by player, by team, et cetera, and then share whatever they want on social media. So we have that sort of a relationship for them. So of course, that's a pretty close relationship. They've given us API access and we do a lot of uh, a lot of great work for them. So on the esports league side, a lot of the big publishers also run the best leagues for that game, right? Like Riot runs, you know, um, LCS and you know League Worlds and you know all of the great league tournaments. And similarly, other publishers run the best uh, esports leagues for that. So for us, you know, working with the publishers, especially having an in to crunching their esports tournaments also gives us a good in to their APIs. And that gives us relationships where we can not only um, take sort of their API, but we give them back a lot more data. Their API, like I mentioned before, doesn't map to Twitch streams. So a lot of the value we add to publishers is saying, hey, you guys can generate stat sheets like crazy. What we can do is we can associate a highlight with every single stat in your stat book. Um, because we can map all of this stuff back to the Twitch streams, not just back to the gameplay on a single uh, on somebody's PC, but back to the Twitch stream. So we can actually map every single stat um, with a highlight. So that's the value that we give back to the publisher. So so they, it's it's definitely a, a symbiotic relationship there. So that's on the sort of esports league side. On the streamer side, you know, they just want to see highlights. They stream on Twitch or YouTube, and they want highlights. And the difference between us and say, you know, there's there's other competitors in the space that have basically recording software uh, on the streamer's PC, and they'll sort of record the gameplay, and you know, some use AI, some some don't to try to make clips. Um, the difference in our approach is we don't have any software on somebody's PC, so there's nothing that impacts the the FPS. So they can, you know, they just stream on Twitch or YouTube. We pull from Twitch and YouTube. We analyze it. And we give them back highlights. So, so they really like that. For that use case, you know, they don't really care whether we use the API or not. They just want really good highlights that they can post on social media. Uh, VJ, you you preempted my question completely, right? In terms of competitive positioning, because there are, you know, there are other tools like this out there. I think it's interesting because you're right. Almost all the ones I'm thinking of are like more real time, right? There's something running while you're playing. And it's trying to pick out or record sort of the, the right clips while you're playing. For me, that's always been the reason why I don't use them uh, because, you know, I, 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 I try and get maximum FPS on everything. Um, but is that was that a conscious decision like to, that this is batch process sort of after the fact? Or is it more related to your target customer, which feels different, right? Like it yeah. feels like the esports leagues, the big streamers. This is more your target market, not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, little Timmy who's just playing Fortnite after school and, uh, you know, wants to record clips to share with his friends. Is that fair to say or? I think that's that's fair to say on all dimensions that you mentioned, actually. So, you know, this was definitely 100 percent a conscious decision. And um, part of it is we have patented technology and we can get into that a little bit later that 
you know, where we can sort of, I was talking about PUBG before, but we can give the the leagues and the big esports leagues, not just sort of clips and highlights of theirs, but we can actually personalize those highlights to their fan bases. So, you know, if you want to see, let's just take, um, you know, LCS as an example, if you want to see TSM, uh, Paul and Jimmy, your favorite team is Team Liquid. Um, and, you know, each of you guys have different favorite players on there and you want to see different moments of their play. Like we can personalize from the same set of matches, TSM plays Team Liquid. Each of you guys can see different highlights. And and so so based on sort of our personalization ability, yes, our target market is definitely sort of the um, the leagues and sort of the bigger streamers that have bigger audiences. and those guys absolutely will not, you know, no sort of esports player will want something else running on their PC while playing, you know, playing the game. So because we have this patent, because we have figured out how to pull directly from Twitch and YouTube, um, that's definitely a conscious part of our differentiation. We don't want anything running on the PC. Is that specific to the, you know, like you mentioned, Paul and I as two opposing users, is that specific to some type of information that I input when I onboard on your platform? Or are you able to also apply that, for example, to a North American viewer that might have a greater interest in certain aspects of a game or a tournament versus someone in the Middle East, Asia, Latin America, where where we're noticing, you know, not just obviously that games are being different, that perhaps those interests in that match, they might be more focused on on, you know, one feature versus another. Both. We would have to work with our client to figure out what they want to do. So we could certainly have a very simple, um, you know, while you're set up, just tell us your preferences, right? Who's your, what's your favorite team? Who are your favorite players? What types of moments do you want to see? That's pretty much it. You know, it's not a lot of questions, but if you give us that as part of the initial user setup, then boom, you get a very personalized experience. Or um, you know, if users don't want to input that or the client doesn't want us to ask those questions, then to your point, we can sort of make some assumptions based on where you're logging in from uh, or other factors, sort of what you want to see. Either way, over time, that will get better and better as you start, you know, playing certain clips and forwarding other clips and things like that. We'll know your preferences. And so those preferences will improve over time. But yeah, as a starting point, we could do either way. So what are you seeing from your early users? Uh, what, what are they interested in? What's the data telling you? Where are you exploring and expanding effort and then redirecting based off of what you're learning from, from these uh, initial adopters of your, of your platform? Yeah, so definitely difference between esports leagues and streamers. So esports leagues, for instance, um, they love our highlights portal. They love the fact that they can now search through all of their highlights and then figure out what's the best clip and post that clip. So what they want is it's almost like they're overwhelmed by the number of clips that they can generate. So they want us to add more sort of built-in filtering like, hey, show me the five most exciting plays or show me the best grenade kills. And add in like scoring elements to those things like, hey, if a grenade kill killed, you know, four people, that's better than a grenade kill that killed one person or, you know, you know, looking at damage score and things like that. So we're, we're getting to that level of detail where behind all of the events, can we figure out sort of a detailed score based on whether it's the damage done, the number of people killed or other fact or the impact sort of on that match. So, so the, I think the esports league's definitely a little bit more sophisticated in terms of um, what types of moments they want to post and what they want from our tool. Um, for the streamers, it's more, you know, initially we had like, hey, we will summarize your matches. So if you stream 20 matches in um, on a day, on a given day, let's say you're, you know, a Fortnite streamer, um, Battle Royale game. So not all the time are you going to say get to the top 10, you know, maybe you die early in 10 of those matches. So we'll ignore those 10 where you die early. The other 10, you know, we'll look at, you know, match by match, how did you do and give you sort of a three minute summary of each match where, you know, you can, you can see all the kills, you can see the beginning, you can see the kills, you can see the ending. Um, and so we get, we gave them this, this was like a year ago and they were like, you know, this is okay, but I just need individual moments. I need shorter clips. And in the past few months, it's crazy how much TikTok has taken over, right? So 
So they just want like individual moments that they can post on TikTok. So that's sort of become, you know, much, much more important for streamers is, hey, just give me those those individual moments. And, you know, as we've made these changes, we've asked streamers and they sort of love that. They just love, hey, boom, you know, they come into our dashboard. Um, and the process is, you know, we have a, a uh, streamer dashboard. So the streamer comes, let's say the first time, um, they create a sizzle ID to, to sign in. And the first step is to connect your Twitch or YouTube, wherever you're streaming from. So it's pretty simple. They just, you know, hit connect, plug in their Twitch ID, and then we start to see their streams. And then they can come and say, hey, process this or this for me. And then they come back in and they get all the highlights. And so once they get the highlights, you know, a lot of them just, just want the one-click sharing options from those clips so they can look through the clips and say, hey, which ones do I want to share to TikTok? So just giving giving them that sort of individual moments and TikTok sharing ability was sort of a huge win with streamers. Of course, you know, we'll have Twitter, Discord, other stuff as well. But TikTok in the past few months has really taken off. It's funny you say that, VJ. We had uh, tips out from OTK on the podcast a few weeks ago. And, you know, he was saying Twitch, YouTube, these are not the growth platforms, right? This is not where you grow your audience. That's where you monetize your audience. The growth right. is like on TikTok. So everyone's scrambling to try and make content for these like very short form kind of platforms. Um, they must love, you know, the ability to just completely automate that. I will say hearing you describe this, though, makes me massively jealous because we here have a similar challenge. Right. And I'm just this may be a silly question, but like uh, it, it it goes to sort of your experience with AI and tech and and how far do you think this can go? Right. Because. Pulling clips from a, a live stream of, you know, Shroud playing Valorant. I'm, I'm not I'm not trying to say it's it's easy, but I feel like you can track kills. You can, you know, the, the, when he gets two or three kills in a row, right? The AI is probably smart enough to know that's probably a really great clip. Yep. Um, what what feels more complex, but feels at least to me like the Holy Grail is like, how do you ingest a live stream like ours, which, by the way, every Wednesday night, 830 p.m. Eastern time, um, where like, is there some way does the AI get good enough where when I've got a hot take or Jimmy's got a hot take, it can it can take just that clip. Right. And and yep. we don't have to do it all manually. But is there some end game like that? I think that's a great point. And honestly, if we tried our AI today, we would probably do pretty well um, because, you know, like I said, we analyze the audio and chat. So even though there may not be gameplay in your podcast, we're listening to the excitement level. So we're analyzing mm. like, hey, loud, how loud are you? Are you guys laughing? You know, um, <laughs> and if we have the face cam, we're even looking at your face and saying, you know, can we do a sentiment analysis on the facial expressions? That's so, cool. you know, so loudness and facial expressions give us sort of excitement level of you guys, of, of the casters or commentators. And then depending on sort of how active your chat is, you know, like, yes, our chat is our chat analysis is a little bit more fine tuned to Twitch chat in the sense of like, we're analyzing the Twitch lingo and the, all the yeah. emotes on Twitch and things like that. But we do an analysis on that to figure out, okay, how, you know, how excited are, 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 you know, the folks watching and, you know, sometimes like the streamer will go to take a bathroom break and someone cracks a joke on chat and chat goes crazy. Right. So you can't use chat 100% by itself, yeah. but if you combine it with, you know, the, the video that we see and we see you guys and you guys cracked a joke. Um, and so we caught that and we see the chat then we know, yeah, that, that it's pretty good. So we haven't tried it on non-gaming use cases, but my guess is it would probably work pretty well. Our end goal is to be able to summarize any video. Uh, like I said, we have built technology where we can point to Twitch or YouTube and we can actually create highlights without generating a new video. We can actually point to the source um, on, you know, the source mod on Twitch or YouTube. So if we know, for instance, there's kills at 529, 1514, and 1916, we can say we can basically have a player on your browser that points to Twitch, the Twitch VOD, and says, okay, jump to 529, take 15 seconds, jump to, you know, 14, 15, take 15 seconds, jump to 1916, take 20 seconds there. And to you, it would look like a highlight reel, 
you would never know that this is not a new MP4. It's just that we're pointing back to the source and we're using pointers to show you the best moments of that VOD. So our ultimate goal is to do what you just said. Basically, you see any one hour YouTube video, whether it's gaming or not, we'll figure out the best moments and there should be a button next to it that says, that says sizzle and we'll give you the best two minutes or five minutes, how much ever you want in that one hour based on all the analysis that we do. I mean, that has massive implications, I feel like, especially just on Twitch. Like if you're just looking at Twitch, where today just chatting is the largest category on Twitch, right? It's not Valorant. It's not um, like that. I think that has major, major implications. I love that you guys are taking that B2B approach. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'll call it B2B, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, even though the streamers are an end user. But um, what, was it something in your background, VJ, or, or an experience you had maybe previously that that took you down this B2B path, whereas when basically everyone else has gone sort B2C. of the self-serve B2C path? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So yes, I think I'm sort of traditionally more B2B. At, at Google, I did both B2B and B2C. But you know, I was in a group called Google Enterprise, which was all B2B. And then even on the payment side, which was mixed, I worked with a lot of sort of merchants and you know, did B2B stuff and facilitated sort of merchant merchant payments and things like that. And Adyen was all B2B. So I've done a lot of B2B to answer your question. But also when we looked at this space and we said we can create highlights, so there's two options. One is you can work with streamers and leagues, take a more B2B approach, or you could say, I'm going to create highlights for the 5 billion gamers, because now you add mobile, that's that's about the number of gamers, how many ever, it's, it's in the billions, right? Yep. And um, and so you could you could take that B2C approach, but what we realize is changing habits is really, really hard, right? So changing a consumer habit, like we did some tests in the early days and we we actually thought about B2C, but you know, people are so used to going to Twitch, you know, at least when we started going to Twitch for live streaming, going to YouTube for highlights. Now that's changed. They go to TikTok for highlights. So their habits have changed a little bit. But, but still, they're used to going to two, maybe three destinations today. Adding another destination that's an unknown brand is a really, really hard proposition. Uh, it's hard to change gamers' habits. And so we said, hey, we, we can work with streamers and leagues. And over time, they're going to get the word out to fans, out to the broader billions of fans about Sizzle anyways. So uh, we're not... We're not um, excluding a B2C approach in the future, but to start with for an unknown company like us, B2B just made a lot more sense. Um, I, I just have one, uh, this is sort of a, a minor question and Jimmy maybe alluded to it. How does language play into this at all, right? Like, and, and how much, because a lot of the growth we're seeing in esports is not just in North right. America. Obviously there's a lot of talk of Asia and India and the Middle East. Um, how does language factor into this? Does it is it exponentially more difficult in a different language? Does you know do you need to rebuild the whole thing to to handle lang chats in different languages and streamers in different languages or commentators in different languages? Or is this is this something that's that's relatively easy to tackle given the current system? Um, I'd say it's on the easier side. It's not easy by any means, but it's not as hard as you may think. So for instance, one of our clients is, is Garena. So Garena Free Fire, as you know, Great. huge yep. game globally. So we do a lot of work for them in Latin America, and they're big in Latin America and Asia. And so we do a lot of work uh, in Latin America. So, you know, Free Fire Latino America League is huge league in, in that continent, South America. And so Spanish and Portuguese are, are the primary languages there. And so, yeah, of course we can, you know, do Free Fire in English, but doing Free Fire in Spanish requires we read a lot of the notifications that are on screen. So instead of English notifications, so instead of, you know, killed or eliminated, you know, we have to read the Spanish notification, right? Yep. So that's a little bit different. Um, but if you think about gameplay, like gunfire is the same sound. So when we're detecting a battle, it doesn't matter what language you're speaking. There's only one language with gun, yeah. guns and gunfire. Um, and even the audio, like loudness, laughter, things like that, that's all the same. Right. Yes, we do need to analyze. Sometimes we analyze what they're saying. Like in PUBG, we analyze, you know, are they talking about the circle shrinking? So we can show the users, hey, 
here's the map and here's when the map is shrinking and the circle is shrinking. So there's a few things that we we need to, to understand the, the language of what they're saying. But by and large, you can do a lot of AI and even analyzing someone's face or analyzing the the tone of their voice or their laughter. That's you know, doesn't change from language to language. So yes, we do have to make some changes, but it's not actually as bad as you think. Kind of like what they say, most conversation being nonverbal, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, body exactly. language and kind of getting those uh, emotions out. Uh, and, and that same, well, slight digression here, but kind of down the same path, because you had, you had mentioned Karina being a large client of yours. We had talked a little bit about streamers, a little bit about uh, the leagues in particular. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you guys are, you know, more, more again on the business side of things, how you're monetizing. I mean, do you have a subscription model? Do you have an enterprise model? Uh, we've talked at length and I think we could fill two episodes or more on the use case and the tech behind what you're building because it's just so impressive. I'm curious now on the business side of things, how you're planning on staying in business. Yeah, no, I mean... Yes, don't get me wrong. <laughs> we, you know, I come from Silicon Valley, and so here there's a saying: just build a product, and you know, focus on the users, and the money will follow. <laughs> and so, so part of part of my problem is being at Google too long. I believe that that too much, um, and so so we're very focused on users right now. Yes, we are making money. We actually do charge Karina, we charge PUBG, we charge our esports leagues clients, and for them, we actually charge a monthly subscription. We, you know, give them the highlights portal. There's a licensing licensing fee. Our patent patented technology has gone behind that. So this is, you know, we make it really easy for them to search through all their highlights. Um, and so they're basically licensing our hosted software. So they pay a monthly fee for that. And there is a separate sort of depending on how much AI we do, that monthly fee may change the license. We have different tiers of that licensing. Um, for streamers right now, it's actually free. So if you have streamers listening, come on over to Sizzle and sign up and we'll crunch your highlights for free. Um, over time, that will change. We can't keep it free forever, of course. Um, but we want to first make sure we're really adding a lot of value for streamers. They're getting, being able to share to the right channels. They're getting the right moments. You know, we just expect them to give us feedback and improve our product. But, you know, probably in the next, three to six months, you know, we're, we're going to start to monetize them. But for right now, it's absolutely free for streamers. Um, Vijay, I'm curious uh, where you see, like, part of what I think I find so special about your, your product, what you guys are doing is the demographics and the behaviors are on your side, right? Like, mm -hmm. even with us, what we're seeing is, you know, people love the short form content we put out. Uh, you know, the, there's a younger demographic that consumes it. We, you know, no one listens more than like three minutes after that. Everyone drops off, um, right? Like there's an age group that where shorter is clearly better in terms of the kind of content that they consume. I mean, you guys in some ways make that, if you want to call it a problem worse, right? But also are playing into this, this behavior change of shorter and shorter, ever shorter kind of content. And, you know, give me the feed, the TikTok feed of constant, like, instant gratification um is has there been any pushback at all from any client potential client you've talked to that says you know we're maybe worried that if we reduce everything to clips and highlights that it puts sort of the three-hour broadcast that we do for this esports program potentially at risk right because the kids are just going to you know consume the 10 highlights you give them on tiktok and they may not end up watching the three hour broadcast. Has that ever come up? So that's come up as a discussion topic, but it's more as like kind of what we're having. Like when you talk about this space, people think it's it's gonna happen, but like for everyone, you know, that's that's actually doing it, they know that if they don't give people highlights, they're not gonna come back and watch. That's how you generate interest. True. So th they know that one sort of helps the other. So at this point, at least on esports, there's so much growth, there's so much interest in these, you know, sort of big tournaments that people aren't worried that we're going to sort of take away from from the viewership of the tournaments. Um but, you know, like I know that's a huge topic in the sports world, for example, if we if we sort of crossed over to that world where, you know, all these sports 
publishers and and the teams and the leagues are worried that hey the young generation's only watching esports nobody's watching sports um so should i give them highlights in which case they'll never watch sports and only watch <laughs> highlights but they have no choice they have to do it because who the hell is going to watch a 3 hour baseball match anymore right like it's just not happening so um so yeah i mean i think i think there's definitely a difference between sports and esports and in the esports world I think what you're saying is less of a concern because they know that the audience wants this stuff. So give them the highlights, get them excited, let them develop like favorite players and get attached to the teams and the leagues and they're, they'll automatically come in. Peter, I, I, my last question is really around, you know, something that comes up on our meta business podcast. Um, and it's more sort of, I'll call it forward looking, which is, you know, we're seeing this trend towards and and it's, you know, Dapper Lab started this where you could go buy NFTs of highlights, right? Video highlights from the basketball world or wherever. What is your feeling on sort of clips and highlights intersecting with NFTs specifically, right? Do you see this as being a, a massive potential market uh, within gaming and esports? Is it something you guys are looking at? Is it something you think is nonsense and was never going to happen. Like, I'm curious where, where are your feelings and thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, of, of course we're looking at it. Of course, you know, there, there's a sort of, a, a, it's a brave new world out there and there's a lot of opportunities that NFTs bring about NFTs, you know, just the, the just the notion that NFT is sort of a digital certificate. It can identify who exactly owns this piece of content. That's pretty unique. Um, that said, we're not sort of rushing into it and we're not, you know, saying, oh, we need to do this right now because we need to figure out how to do it the right way. Like, what do people want? Like, we don't want to give streamers and their fans something that they don't want. Um, so right now our core for focus is to, you know, give them highlights, give them clips, um, but be part of that streamer fan engagement and, and really help sort of fans be, be part of that. Right. And in that process, if there's a way of, you know, getting NFTs to fans, because just we could convert any moment to an NFT, right? Like what good's that going to do? Instead of seeing, you know, Twitch clips or seeing, you know, individual MP3 highlights, you see an NFT, but at the end of the day, that that's not going to solve anything new. But if you can solve something around streamer fan engagement and use NFT smartly with that and, and sort of help um, streamers not only get fans more engaged, but also help them monetize because every streamer is looking for more money, then that's certainly an opportunity. We don't have the answers yet. We definitely don't have the answers. I don't think anyone does, but I think we're looking at that space. We're talking to streamers, talking to leaks, trying to figure out, is there something here? that makes sense to solve streamer fan engagement and also monetization. So I think more to come on that. We don't have the answers, but I think we are taking it seriously. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, um, uh, you know, what does this mean? And, and part of, part of the, we think at least as of now, the answer is let's not focus on the, the three letters NFT, right? Like if you look at what hundred thieves did, what about a month ago, they, you know, had their, their necklace, their, you chain, know, sort yeah. of their chain thing. They didn't mention NFT on it, you know. They just talked about, you know, digital ownership and you know, overnight. I think they had like three hundred thousand people sort of download it. But like, I don't. I, when I looked at it, there wasn't those letters NFT on it. So yeah. I think how you position it to the audience, um, what the value, most importantly, what the value is to both the streamer and the fan buying it, like. I think a lot of that still needs to get figured out. And we're, we're definitely talking, doing our fair share of talking to streamers to, to help figure it out. But, but we're not sort of rushing into it just to say, Hey, we can mint it, highlight into NFT. Anyone can. Right. So, yeah. Yep. I, I love that answer. Um, guys, that brings us to, uh, Jimmy, unless you had a, a, a last question, I wanted to kick it no, over to you here. I got about five questions. We're about to head into okay, good. So let's do it. Um, for if guys, if you're new to the podcast, everyone's favorite new segment, this is judge Jimmy's cross examination where Jimmy's going to throw five pretty rapid fire questions at VJ, uh, get to know VJ a little bit better. Judge Jimmy, take it away. All right. Uh, first one up for you, VJ. And you know, we, we've actually had about two or three episodes now where I didn't get a guest that had one. And I'm hoping with, uh, with your history, uh, you mentioned growing up in the eighties, uh, and nineties that we'll have a, a solid answer here. Who's your favorite Ninja Turtle? 
<laughs> oh God. <laughs> um, I, I, I was never a big, uh, TMNT guy. Um, so I forget, I forget all the names, man. It's been a long time. Yeah. No worries. We can, we can opt into Power Rangers if that's more to your speed, but no, I don't want to put you on the hot no, spot. I was never, never into, never into them either. Yeah. Let, let's stick to gaming. What's your go-to gamer snack or drink? Um, so lately I've been doing, uh, a lot of, um, these, these protein powder shakes with like banana strawberry or banana blueberry or something like that. Um, so I've just been trying to do more protein lately. So that's been my go-to drink lately. Yeah. Super healthy. Um, what is, as someone that's played Atari and conceivably every iteration and every console and, and gaming product since then, what's your favorite video game? Favorite video? It's still got to be NBA Jam back in college when that first the NBA Jam in the arcades. I don't know if you guys yeah. remember that, but when like we were in college, those arcade games came out, and it was like it was we would spend we would skip classes and we would be playing those games uh, in the arcade. Like that that was that, that was just a blast. Like all, all my buddies and I, we were just so into it. I got yeah. a friend who had one uh, in in their home, and it was like. You know, no one had these in their houses back then, yeah. right? And this guy yeah. had NBA Jam, so we were religious with it. Yeah. VJ, um, we have the four man, the four person uh, NBA Jam at the office and studio here in oh, New York. Oh, do you really? So, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, we'll have to have you come play next time you're in the city. Absolutely. Um, okay, let's go with two more. Uh, what is your social media platform of choice? Not just to Ooh. use yourself, but to get, you know, your gaming news and updates however you want to interpret that question. Yeah. I mean, I still like Twitter. Maybe I'm a little old school. Like I don't think I'm as young as the TikTok generation. So, so maybe I'm a slow adopter on that, but I still like, I still like Twitter. You know, you get a lot of different types of news feeds. You get your gaming news, you get, you know, other stuff. I have a lot of sort of friends, influencers on Twitter. So. Always a solid choice. Last question uh, for all of our young, impressionable uh, gamers and, and business people to be, if you could go back to school or if you were currently, you know, uh, still in the education phase of your life, well, I suppose we all are to some degree, but if you could go back to, uh, an educational institution, what would you take or major, uh, that would help you, that would better help you today? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, the statistics, I think everything is about data. Like everything we do is data <laughs> and number crunching and stuff like that. So anyone that's graduating today has to be able to handle data. So I would, I would advise them to take, to take statistics, you know, shout out to Miss Colton, my statistics teacher from high school. I did not <laughs> try hard enough. <laughs> Back to you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Judge Jimmy. VJ, thank you so much uh, for being on the podcast. If if you want to be found or followed or, uh, you know, if people want to learn more about sizzle, where can they find more or follow you guys? Um, you know, what, what are some of the, the, the places they can go? Absolutely. So our website is sizzle.gg. Um, so that's definitely a great place to start. Like I said, if you're a streamer, come on over, sign up. If you're a league, just, you know, um, reach out to me. Uh, I'm Vijay V I J A Y at sizzle.gg, or I'm sure there's a contact form on the website. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, social handles, at SizzleGG is our Twitter handle. So, you know, come there, uh, join that and, you know, keep track of all our news. VJ, I love what you guys are doing. I think it's going to be such a massive success. Uh, I, I can't wait to actually try it to see if it works on our <laughs> on our okay. live streams to see if it can pick out, uh, you know, the hot takes and things. Um, yeah, and we, so, should, we should try it. Send send me. I, <laughs> I guess I can just download one of your podcasts and, and then try it. But we should do that. I'll do that and, and send you and see what happens. It, it would be fun to see. I, I, I really encourage everyone, all the streamers listening to this, uh, obviously the, the leagues and the people who work for the leagues and the big developers that follow us. Um, go check out sizzle.gg. Um, VJ, thank you. Jimmy, thank you as always. Just a couple of reminders for our listeners. Every Wednesday evening, we do a live weekly news show. We cover all the news from the last week. It's a bigger cast. It's me and Jimmy and Jeff, the juice Cohen and Lindsay, the boss boss. And, uh, it's a lot of fun. We welcome you guys to come join that Wednesdays, 8 30 PM Eastern time, basically on every single platform. Also make sure to follow business of esports where business of esports are busy sports everywhere on TikTok, on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, you name it. Uh, we are on every single platform. You can find our content everywhere. 
as always, thank you guys for tuning in every week and we will see you next week.